nuevamente buenas tardes, y disculpen, bueno, es bastante usual cuando estamos con este tipo de, digamos, de, de eventos, a veces sucede este tipo de problemas, uno no quiere, pero sucede. Bueno, nuevamente, bienvenidos a todos ustedes, este, agradezco que estén acá, agradezco por su participación, por su interés, ¿no?, en este tema tan, por lo menos para algunos de nosotros, tan apasionantes como es la física de neutrinos, es, esto es un tema que está generalmente no es visto, no es estudiado con mucha frecuencia, o se habla muy poco inclusive, ¿no?, en nuestros cursos profesionales, en la universidad, sin embargo, digamos, es, es un tema que está, eh, es un tema de, de avanzada, es un tema que básicamente está en la frontera del conocimiento, ¿no?, nuestro. Estamos tratando de entender qué es o ¿no? por qué siquiera está aquí ese tal neutrino. Entonces, para eso, esta vez nuevamente contamos con la presencia de, de, del doctor Helio Damota. Él es un profesor investigador en el Centro Brasileiro de Pesquisas Físicas en Río de Janeiro, Brasil, ¿no? quien tiene larga, una gran trayectoria, una larga experiencia trabajando eh, en experimentos ¿no? de neutrinos, ya lleva varios, digamos, diría que lleva más de una década trabajando en esto tranquilamente, y muy gentilmente, ¿no?, nos va a brindar un mini curso, justamente un fundamento, ¿no?, las bases de la física de neutrinos, ¿ok? Espero que todos los presentes puedan eh, disfrutar y aprovechar este, este tipo de, esta, estos tres días de este mini curso. Por favor, Hagan las preguntas que ustedes consideren, ¿no? Las que consideren apropiadas, las que ustedes crean, si no queda algo. Me lo, lo escriben por el chat y vamos, yo voy comunicándole a él o vamos interactuando. Por favor, no tengan, ¿no? No tengan, eh, no sé, temor, vergüenza de preguntar algo que puede, les parecería que fuera tan trivial o simple. Por favor, pregunte, estamos para eso. Queremos que, ¿no? Eh, al final de estos tres días, por lo menos podamos llevárnoslo. ¿no? Eh, una, quizás no todo, pero una buena gran cantidad de información. ¿Okay? Bueno, eh, creo que ya podemos comenzar. Elio de Mota, ¿estás listo? Estamos listos cuando estás. Ok, okay. You, can, you can hear me, right? Very well. Ok, uh, I want again thank Professor Castro Monte for the opportunity and hope that next year, once this COVID situation is over, there will be the opportunity to go to Lima in person, as I did a few years ago, and then we can do something better for one week or so, and we can get into more details. Uh, what Professor Castro Monte said uh, is very true. So, unfortunately, we don't get much about neutrinos at, at college. In fact, I think we get nothing uh, about neutrinos at college. We just know something we don't talk much about, and then we go to our graduate studies, and Then we uh, have to face the reality of neutrinos and then try to understand this, what's going on. And what he said is that basically what you have to understand is what neutrinos are about, why neutrinos are around us, what, what role the, do neutrinos play in the universe. And of course, in these three days, I uh, have three very short presentations. It's not possible to go through details in neutrinos. It would be too, too much. So what I hope to do is to arise, arouse your curiosity, as Professor Castro Monto said. So for people who love, have, have passionate about physics, maybe this three brief presentation should be enough to at least to bring your attention into neutrinos. And as Professor Castro Monto said, don't be ashamed of asking questions. And maybe you can also write questions to send a message to Professor Castro Monte that will share questions with me, and then we can work out some answers uh, if, if you can answer the question. So do not be very disappointed if this short uh, group of three presentations is not very deep. The idea is not to go very deep into the subject, but to call attention, to show some funny, some very interesting features of neutrinos, okay? So that's why I call it neutrinos basics. Okay, let's start with the very beginning. The very beginning, I, as we, I believe everybody has heard about, there was the idea of a Big Bang that had, at some moment, uh, years and years ago, thousands, millions or billions of years ago, 
I try to speak slowly, okay? Uh, years ago, there was a big bang, and this big bang, we had matter and the antimatter came into being. And the idea is that they, they were created equally, the same amount of matter and the same amount of antimatter were created as the big explosion. Uh, this is two questions. Some people uh, question this idea, but that's what we have to work now. But what happened then, that's what do you think? Uh, the universe started cooling. Yeah? And the, as the universe was cooling down, so the temperature was going down, the matter and the antimatter, I, as you probably heard about, when matter and the antimatter get together, they annihilate each other. So the same amount of matter and the same amount of antimatter, they get together, and poof, there is no, nothing anymore except energy. So the universe started cooling down, and then matter and the antimatter annihilate. So, if at the beginning we had the same amount of matter and the same amount of antimatter, eventually they would annihilate totally and there will be no matter in the universe. There will be only light. So the universe will be a very boring place. Nothing there, just energy, just light. Okay? But that's not what happens, right? We are here now. Okay? So, whatever happens, the reality is that after all this annihilation of matter and the antimatter, there is, there is still plenty of matter in the universe. Lots of, lots of matter. So, how, how can you explain that? How can you understand that? S something is clearly wrong in the picture we have from the universe. So, something is not working well. And one thing that may not be working well is that maybe, maybe the physics of the matter and the physics of antimatter are not exactly the same. So there is an, as an asymmetry. There is, there is no symmetry in the physics in the way that at some point more matter exists than antimatter. And you see, it does not really have to be a lot. Because if you look at the universe now, we see zillions and zillions and zillions of stars. So matter is all around. But a big number is something very relative. Okay? If at the very, very, very beginning, for instance, if at some point you have zillions and zillions and zillions and zillions of matter, and zillions and zillions and zillions of antimatter, but just a few zillions less, at the end, there will be more matter than antimatter. And if you have matter and matter in the same amount, but the physics is not the same, this annihilation process will not work the same way, and then we, are, we end up with what we call matter. So something's wrong. And this is what we call maybe CP symmetry violation. We can talk a little bit about that. So the universe, we believe the universe, the laws of physics follow some symmetries. Yeah? And maybe some symmetries that we call CP is, is violated. Is, is, there's no such symmetry as you think, and this is true with not with the more matter than antimatter. So, but how neutrino? What does neutrino have to do with that? Maybe neutrino has a lot to do with that, and that's one of the main projects in physics now. Is to find out if neutrino could be responsible for this huge difference of matter that makes us makes it possible for us to exist. So this is started with what we call beta decay. This is something that we usually we see in college, radiation, basic. And what happens in radiation is that if you get a very basic physics, uh, first year physics, whatever, and you have two bodies, so let's say you have two pieces of mass, M1, M2, whatever, and you put them together with, uh, uh, let's see, I have two pieces of matter here, okay? And let's see that we have a spring connected to piece, okay? I call this M1 and this M2, okay? So if, the, if this is spring, this is a spring, okay? So we have this spring, so we have an energy there when we have a spring. If you remember, the energy is about, it's a function of the spring constant itself. And if at some point we release these two masses, 
like say just cutting the spring, whatever, these two masses will be released and they move away from each other with some speed, some like each one of them will get. So the energy that it was there in the system will be shared by the two mass, M1 and the M2. And it's very easy to calculate if you use the energy, energy conservation, the momentum conservation, it's very easy to calculate and to see that if you have uh, energy here at the beginning, I know energy, M1 and M2 will always come out of the system with the ex exactly the very same energy. So if I make a plot of the energy of, say, the mass M2, this plot will be something like that. Okay? And the uh, M2. And if I make a plot for the other one, energy M2, we come with a very precise energy, say E2 and here E1. In, the, in such a way that E1, of course, plus E2 is equal to E. But if I repeat this experiment many, many times, all of this is very same energy, E, okay? M1 will come with E1 and M2 with E2. Always, exactly, they share perfectly, okay? So at the beginning of last century, uh, this experiment was done using tritium. Tritium, as you may remember, is a kind of a hydrogen. So, so the tritium would just decay. So the, like if the, the tritium would split in two masses, like say like that. One was, the, one was helium and the other one was the electron. Now we know the electron, this may, maybe was not very clear, but the fact that we have a system here with an energy whatever it was the energy that could be calculated, and the system is split into bodies, okay? And according to this basic of physics, based on conservation of energy and momentum, both of them, especially this one here, the electric, would come out always with a very, very, very precise energy, okay? So for surprise, people were very surprised when they run the experiment and they saw that this, this would be the energy expected. energy. They observed that the, this electron never ever would come out with this expected energy. And in fact, they would see that it was expected. Sometimes the electron would come out with this energy or this or this or this or this. Or this. So there was an expected, a, con a continuum. And they would expect that. So that means if you take this seriously, that means that see, this energy here is missing. This was the energy that was supposed to be in the electron. This is the energy that really came. So there is an energy that's missing in the process. That would mean that if somehow uh, energy was not energy was not conserved conserved. Okay, energy was not conserved, and this would be a serious problem, and it brought attention to many physicists how to deal with this situation. Okay, then one guy, that's Wolfgang Pauli, that you know, came with a possible solution, okay? And he was pretty much in despair, and basically he said, if you pay attention to here, okay? He wrote a letter, there would be a, a, a meeting in Tübingen, and then he's, it was a very important meeting and he sent a letter to people and said basically that it was written, I have hit upon a desperate remedy to save the exchange theorem of statistics and the law of conservation of energy. So we say, okay, no, 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 no. I don't accept the idea that the energy is not conserved. I find a solution. So they found a remedy for the solution. Huh? But he was not very confident about his <clears throat> solution. Huh? But basically what he said is the following. <clears throat> okay, folks. <clears throat> this, the problem is the following. <clears throat> we don't have two particles coming out of there. As we, we have three. <clears throat> we have this electron. We have the helium. And 
there is something else that's there. Something that you cannot see, but is there. So rather than have a two-body decay process, we have three. Three body. And so the energy that was missing, th this is Hercules who is barking because someone arrived here. So this missing energy is not missing, missing fact. This missing energy is carried by this third particle here. And this third particle would be a neutrino. He did not call it neutrino, by the way. But this third particle, we have no charge, no electric charge. And according to him, we have also no mass. So this third particle that he just took out of his hat had no charge, no mass, no nothing. But it was there just to carry out the energy. Yeah. This was very embarrassing because he was solving a problem but creating another problem. Huh? Yeah. Ghosts, we, physicists don't like ghosts. Huh? A particle that's there, nobody can see, well, what about... So he decided not to go to this important conference. And then basically he said, he cannot go, I cannot go to Tübingen in person because it's... I am indispensable here in Zurich because of a ball. There will be a ball, a party, and they said it would be much more important for him to be at the party than going to Tübingen. I have to face people and talk about this embarrassing situation. So, but anyway, it was a solution. So, he was, okay, so just a repeat. He was, uh, the next day or so, a few months later, he was really disappointed. And he basically said that, I, he, said, he said that, I have made something very bad proposing a particle that cannot be detected. A theoretical physicist should never do that. Okay, but in physics, if you cannot see something, you cannot detect, you cannot observe, well, that thing does not exist. You cannot just uh, uh, invent a ghost to explain something. But he did. Maybe he had drunk too much before the, the ball, who knows. But the problem is that, strange or not, that solution, well, was a good solution, save the conservation of energy. And people start to work around. Oh, let's see if this neutrino, this Dr. Pauli neutrino really uh, does something, maybe. And they start developing theories about neutrino, how things work. And at one point, they say, okay, if this neutrino exists, as Dr. Pauli said, well, we have to find a way to detect it. Yeah? We have to find a way to detect the neutrino. And then, Betty and Pear, that were two physicists, decided to calculate what this cross-section? But well, this is in Portuguese. Oh, my goodness. No, this is in English. So they decide to calculate what the neutrino cross-section would be. What's a cross-section? We have to understand that. That cross-section basically tells us the probability of something happening. Okay? Uh, an example I, uh, I like to give is the following. I go to the basketball. Basket. People know basketball. There is a small basket. And the ball, you have to throw the ball, and the ball has to go into the basket. Okay, if I go to a basket court and get a ball, and I throw the ball, huh? and chances are, here is the basketball, and here is the ball. Okay, I throw the ball there. Chances are that I'm going to miss. And I do it once, and twice, three, four, five, five, ten, ten, and I miss just. There are some guys, a very good basketball player, who we all hit the, <clears throat> the basket. Because it's very hard for me to do that. So the chances of me hitting the ball, the, the basket itself is small. Of course, if I try it 10 times, 100 times, 1,000 times, eventually I will just <clears throat> have it done right. But of course, if rather than have that small basket, I have a basket that is, say, uh, the ring is about one meter diameter. Oh, it would be much easier for me to get the ball into the basket. Okay? And on the other side, if the ring, if the basket is smaller than the diameter of the ball, I will never do that. Nobody's going to do it. Okay? So pretty much the size of the, the basket affects the probability of getting the ball into the basket. And that's the idea of the cross-section. Imagine that you have one particle here, whatever that particle is, okay? And here you have a target. This here could be, for instance, it just could be a proton, for instance, a proton, okay? 
And the target, maybe the target, target is just a piece of uh, iron or whatever. No? And they started throwing protons there. And the idea is for the proton to, the, the target that's iron is full of protons, for instance. The idea is for this proton, hit another proton in the target. Okay? So this will give us the idea of the cross section. So a very small cross section, see here, the, the cross section here is showing its square centimeter, pretty much like I would do with a basketball. Okay? As bigger this cross section, larger, easier to hit the target. Okay? And this guy, Beth and Perez, they calculated that the cross section for neutrinos directly would be 10 to minus 44. What's a ridiculous small number? Huh? Very, so the, the probability of a neutrino really hit the target, let's say like that, is very, 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 very small. Yeah? Almost impossible to detect it. Huh? Like me trying to, to hit the ball into the basket. So what, what that means in practical terms, it means that uh, I need about a, to have a piece of lead. My target would have to be a piece of lead. The few light years long, say 20 light years long. Huh? Huge, huge. For, for they have a chance of a neutrino to really to interact. Yeah? Of course, you cannot do that. Okay? We don't have enough lead for that. To 20, remember that the light year is the distance that the light travels in one year. And the light travels about 300,000 kilometers in one second. So multiply this by the number of seconds in one year, you see the distance that the light travels in one year, gets to 20 years. This is much, much, much bigger than the solar system itself. So we cannot have a piece of lead that long, that big. No? And there is not enough lead, there is no room, not possible to do. But there is another option, another possibility. Okay, I, I cannot have that much lead, or iron if you want, not much lead, but maybe I can have a small piece of lead and zillions of neutrinos. Zillions and zillions of neutrinos. It's like me going to the basketball field, and rather than just shooting one ball, I can throw 100 balls at once. Chances are that one of the balls will get into the basket. So if I have zillions of neutrinos, I may, maybe I may have one of those zillions of neutrinos interacting with a piece of lead that is a one meter size or a half a meter or so. Okay, but the problem is how to get zillions of neutrinos. Uh, what we saw here in the beginning, supposing that uh, Professor Pauli was right, that one atom of tritium would produce one neutrino. Okay, one neutrino. One. I would need zillions and zillions and zillions and zillions of atom tritium to have zillions of zillions. And what? Of course, it was not possible anyway. Yeah, but that was in the thirties. And so we started in the 40s, something came into existence that could be a solution. Hmm. Although people weren't sure about the neutrino existence, they started developing theories with neutrinos, and then they came to understand a little bit better radiation. And then they developed what we call today a nuclear reactor, and then an atom bomb. What happened in an atom bomb or in a nuclear reactor is a process that's similar to this one here, okay? But not a tritium, so it's another process when you have, for instance, uranium, and the uranium uh, just decays. Decays means it goes to a lower state, so uh, lighter uh, material. And in this process also, neutrino would be produced, okay? And when you have a nuclear explosion, what happens is that we have zillions. Remember the Avogadro, Avogadro number we also see at school. Yeah? The Avogadro number is, if let me see, is something like 6 times 10 to 23 Avogadro. Huh? Six, 10 to 23 is a huge number. So one ball of anything has six, 10 to 23 of whatever. So if you have one ball of oxygen, we have six, 10 to 23 atoms 
molecules of oxygen. And the <clears throat> lightest element, that is hydrogen, the hydrogen mole is one gram. So one gram of hydrogen, that's very little, has six, 10 to 23 atoms of hydrogen. Yeah? Now, if you have a piece of one kilogram of anything, yeah, you have a huge amount of atoms. And these atoms have the protons, and they have neutrons, and they have whatever. So they have zillions and zillions and zillions of things. So in a nuclear explosion, in a nuclear reactor, what you have is they have a mass of uranium, or plutonium, or whatever they use. And this uranium goes through a process that we call a fission. So it basically, it breaks apart. From uranium, it breaks apart into something lighter. And this breaking apart process, lots of things are produced including energy. The energy produced in each breaking is, is small, for us, but you have zillions of atoms breaking apart. And then you have a huge amount of energy in the nuclear bomb just to release all those energy pretty much at once, in a fraction of a second. That's why you have this fantastic explosion. But at the same time, together with this breaking, we come also neutrinos. So, that's what the theory said. Remember that they were not even sure the neutrinos exist, but they could develop a theory and the atom bomb was working. It is works. Okay? Works. So, so, the theory should not be very wrong because it was working. They were able to produce a nuclear bomb. So, if this produces millions, zillions, and zillions of neutrinos, okay, let's use it. And by using this, we can maybe detect the neutrinos. So, what to do? Well, someone had the idea of an experiment called Poltergeist. The Poltergeist experiment was the following. That was the idea they had. Okay? They, would have, they would set a nuclear weapon. There was a nuclear explosion at the top of a tower. This tower was in about 30 meters high. Okay? So they had a bomb. Basically, this is a bomb. Okay? A bomb here. 30 meters. This was done in the desert, of course. Huh? Not in a lab. In the desert. In those days, they were used to <clears throat> detonate nuclear bombs in the desert on Earth's surface. And they are about 40 meters, okay, okay, 40 meters away. There will be a well, okay, a well. And then uh, they would vacuum that well. So we remove all the air from that well with a shaft, back okay, with a vacuum. And the tecto was left here at the top. Okay, the detector was here. Okay, ah. and the, the shaft and the vacuum, no air, nothing there. So at the moment of the explosion, the detector would be released. So the detector would start falling, would start drop, a free fall. Huh? And this fall would last about a few seconds. Okay, you have here the shaft. Have in a few seconds, the detector would hit the, the ground here, the bottom of the shaft. Okay, here the bottom of the shaft would have some material, some foam, a rubber to protect the detector. So there will be less only a few seconds, but during those few seconds, huh, zillions of neutrinos from the bomb huh, of course the neutrinos were going everywhere, but zillions of them would hit detect during the fall. Zillions and zillions and zillions of neutrinos. So they would expect a few days because it lasted one second or so, would recover the detector and then make an analysis of the detector and see if they could really detect a neutrino. Okay, that seems very dramatic. They really start to make this ball there, guys. But they never <clears throat> finish it because there was something less dramatic to use. And that was a nuclear reactor. Remember that the, the basic difference between a nuclear explosion like that and a nuclear reactor is that in a, in a nuclear reactor, this, this process of breaking up the uranium atom or, is controlled. So you don't, you don't have one kilogram of uh, <clears throat> uranium just breaking apart. This is done slowly. So this, all this energy, rather than being released in a fraction of a second, is released slowly, and that's how nuclear reactor work. So nuclear reactor already existed, and 
this uh, was a nuclear reactor, Savannah River in the United States. It was in the 50s or so. There's a, it's a big construction the reactor was there somewhere. And then the nuclear reactor, this process of nuclear reactor, would release about 5, 10 to 13 neutrinos per second, per se square centimeter. A centimeter is about the size uh, of a fingernail. Okay, nail, fingernail. So, about one square meter, uh, one square centimeter. So, the nuclear reactor would release five, 10 to 13, 10 to 13, if you remember, is so one followed by 13 zeros for each second for a square centimeter. So, it's a huge amount of neutrinos if they really exist, and they believe they exist. Okay? This per second. And the nuclear reactor would work not for a few seconds, but for days, weeks, years. So they had a huge flux of neutrinos. But then, how do you detect the neutrino? Okay, how do you expect a neutrino? If the neutrino goes and hit the target, as I said before, what, what do you see? What do you mean hit the target? And the idea is what is called the inverse beta decay. Remember that at the very beginning, I showed you what I call the beta decay. It's a process where, in the case, it was tritium, or whatever, that would decay, go to something lower, and producing a neutrino and an electron. The inverse process is the following. Now we have, in fact, here we have antineutrinos, so, but I'm not talking about this right now. And they will interact with a proton, and it will happen the opposite. You produce what we call a positron, that's the positive, pretty much like an electron with a positive charge, and a neutron. I have to make an observation now, okay? Those days, those, those days, they really did not, they were not sure about the existence of neutrinos to start with, let alone the existence of antineutrinos. So they did not know about antineutrinos. And positrons, let you call this, or, was already known. So they already knew that exists what we call antimatter today, okay? So this was not new. And this was the neutron that already known. So the process, inverse process, inverse beta decay, is the opposite of the beta decay. In the beta decay, they know today what you have is a neutron, neutron that decays, go down some level, producing a proton and the electron and the neutron. The opposite. Yeah. Every time you, you can have some describe some process like this one, we can have the opposite process, the inverse process. So that's what they would expect to see. We have the antineutrino. The time is not clear. Interact with a proton, and when that happens, then it would come a positron. That's a, a positive electron like that. And a positive electron is something that we can detect because it's a particle with a charge, electric charge. So, so we can detect. So that's true. We can detect. And here we have zillions of neutrinos. And of course, the we need a target big enough. Also. So what they did. That's what they did. Here's the picture. They really have a tank, a tank, uh, like a water reservoir, like this one here, that they use two of them, uh, the tank, 200 liters of water. So it's not, not that big indeed, okay? And around them here, uh, they cover the wall of those tanks with photo multiplier. What's a photo multiplier? A photo multiplier is a device electronic device that is sense it can sense perceive light when when light hits a photomultiplier that device produce an electric signal okay like our eyes that's what happens in our eyes right we see because of that light comes into our eye one of our eyes doesn't matter both eyes and that produces some electric signal there that goes to our brain and the brain detects that the light that the electric signal and then interpret that as light. So, so a photo multiplier is like an electronic eye, like say like that. But it's very sensible. Very, very faint amount of very faint amount of light. We produce a signal here. So they cover this tank with photo multipliers, okay? And they have it all of forty kilograms of this product here. Why? What was the idea there? See, that's what they want to see, okay? That's what I want to see. So the process is like that. 
Okay. So let's say here I have uh, the antenna tunnel. See, it's coming. Get into that tunnel because that, uh, that tank that is close to the nuclear reactor. And at some point, that process happens. This process happens here. Okay. Okay. Process. Then we have an, a positron. Here is the positron. And we have the neutron. Here's the neutron. Okay? Then what happens? We have a positron. The positron is the antimatter of the electron. And this, it, it came into existence in a tank with two, 200 liters of water. There's lots of uh, electrons there. It's electrons, zillions and zillions and zillions of electrons. So very soon, this positron will meet an electron. So matter and the antimatter, they meet. When they meet, they annihilate itself. Remember from the beginning, from the Big Bang idea, they annihilate. And then when they annihilate, what's left is energy that comes as gamma ray. Yeah? A gamma ray here. Gamma ray. gamma ray is a kind of radiation, it's a kind of light. Okay? Because with our, what our eyes can see it's just a small spectrum, a small spectrum of the electromagnetic radiation that they call light. Uh, if you have electromagnetic uh, radiation, electromagnetic waves with frequency that's above or below the area that I always see, we don't say it's light, but but the photo multipliers, we build the photo multipliers in such a way that it, it will be sensible to this light here. Okay, so when the positron and the electron annihilate, they produce two gamma rays, light, basically. And those four multipliers that are around the tank, the tank, of course, is closed. We detect that flash of light, ah, light, ah. just light coming there. Why? And then the neutron is there. Oh, they just go around, they're moving around in the environment. Neutron is okay, it's in an environment that's fine. It's neutron is matter. But at some point, and that's why they had that cadmium on there, at some point, that the neutron will be captured by the cadmium. And when an atom, the nucleus, remember that the nucleus, nucleus of an atom has protons and neutrons, and they are stable there. So when they get, if a cadmium atom, nucleus, get one more neutron, it gets pretty much excited. And it cannot stay that way for long. And after some time, poof, and the case, again, returns to a lower level state. And when that happens, again, energy is released. Again, more gamma rays. Gamma ray. Then what happens? If you look at the right side, okay, here we have the neutrinos, okay, anti -neutrin. Here was the interaction. This annihilation here produces light. Okay? And the neutrinos, when the, neut the, uh, no the neutron is captured, more light. Okay? But then what the four multipliers see? The four, four multipliers see the, first, the flash from the neutrino and uh, from the proton from being annihilated. And a few microseconds after, about five microseconds, they see another flash. That's from the neutron being uh, absorbed. So this detection allows them to see this process here. So they say, ha, the process really have to, we, ha we have detected the neutrino. So they finally, they took about 25 years, and this was in 1954 or so, it took about 25 years for them really to detect the, the neutrino. They were pretty much sure they existed because the nuclear reactor, the bomb, what's up, but now they could be sure that it was existing. So the twins existed. Fine. But so what? Uh, then comes the question that Professor Castromont uh, said, and so what? Why do we need this thing? Okay? Everything around us is basically proton, neutron, and electron. Our cells, the tables, the computer, the, the sky, the moon. Uh, what this thing is doing? So and they say, well, this thing is coming to this process when the uh, things decay and produce uh, this, blah, 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 and you have the nuclear bomb. And say, so what? Why do we need this thing? What this thing is doing, for God's sake? 
Uh, so this was a mystery, okay? What, what the role of the Trino in the universe? But that's not all. That's not all. Because remember, you know, we all know that the electrons are particles with a negative charge, and they are in the atom. Proton, neutron, and electron. Fine. But then, by the forties or so, uh, physicists start finding, they detect a particle, something that was also, had also a negative charge. And that thing looked a lot like an electron, very, very much like an electron, but it was not an electron. It was he heavier than an electron. It looked, it looked like an electron, it looked like a heavy electron. Okay. And the thing was called a muon. So a muon was another particle, uh, another one to create a problem, what the hell, what this thing is doing, for God's sake. And looked like an electron, but it was not an electron, because it was having an electron. And also, this thing that was heavy eventually would go back to an electron. Because that's what happens with atoms and particles. They, they always go to the uh, lower level. So you have something that's heavier, eventually it will decay something lighter. And lighter until the bottom, until there is nothing lighter to go. So this moon was pretty much like an electron, huh? but at some point, huh? at some point, it would come into an electron and some other thing. This other thing, again, well, maybe there is a neutrino there also. Neutrinos are very good to explain all these things. Also because, again, we had to make sure that the energy was conserved. But then came the, the question, uh, okay, but this other thing, this other neutrino that you see now, remember that people are unsure about neutrino, now they are thinking about another neutrino. It's the same neutrino, the same that we saw there in the beta decay, or is another neutrino? I mean, well, let's see that. And then in 1962, uh, Schwarzschild led them in made an experiment, in this experiment, they found, hi, hey, guys, this neutrino that comes with the moon, whatever it is, it's not the same as the other one. It's different. So what? Yes, yeah, so basically what they saw is the following. If I have neutrinos coming from this moon, and they make this neutrino interact, remember that the, the way they detect the neutrino was that they had neutrinos, that was very much electrons, right? Interacting, and that neutrino were producing the positrons, basically an electron, okay? So when they tried this new kind of neutrino, you see, for their surprise, or maybe they were not very surprised, this new kind of neutrino would never produce this positron or this electron. It would produce a new one. So there was something different. Huh? One kind of neutrino we always generate produce an electron, and the other one would produce a new one. Uh, why? Well, who knows? They are different. And to make things even more interesting, years later, a third one, a third kind of neutrino was detected in 2000, year 2000. So, 70 years after Pauli's hypothesis. So, what happened is that observed that this particle, this neutrino, that has no electric charge, and basically no mass. Now, we're going to talk about the mass later. Uh, it's very strange, but no matter how strange it is, we have three of them. And how they differ? Okay, none of them has a charge, no. They have no mass, at least they, they, as that's how people thought. So what's the difference? Well, uh, what's the difference? So that's come what you call the family. People say, no, listen, matter comes in family. Huh? It's the following. Neutrino, move and tau belong to the same family. They are pretty much the same. Just one is heavier than the other one. So that's what called leptons comes from uh, Greek, whatever that meant, light or something like that. And so each one of them, the electron, the new one, and the tau, this is the third one that was also found. They, each one of them, each one of them has a partner, a neutrino. The electron has a electron neutrino, a moon has a moon neutrino, and the tau has a tau neutrino. Whatever they are, they are different, okay? And so this makes a family. And then people start asking, well, uh, you know that at the beginning we had that the, a table, uh, the, the table of elements, 
uh, from the 19th century, we have all the elements, we have hydrogen, helium, lithium, and so on, all the elements on the table. And so we could, in principle, you could describe the universe only with those elements that were about 70 or whatever. Everything in nature was made from those elements. Later, things were even simplified. Oh, see those elements, those atoms, in fact, they have protons and neutrons and electrons. What makes the hydrogen atom different from the helium atom is just the number of protons and neutrons and the helium they have. So we were very happy on those days. They were very happy because they could, in principle, describe the whole universe only with three particles, with protons, neutrons, and electrons. Combining them, we have anything in life. And then things start to get complicated because they start finding Part, because as technology advances, we start being able to see more and more. Remember the centuries and centuries ago, uh, astronomers could only see the sky with their bare eyes. Okay? Then when telescopes were developed, they were able to see more. They started finding things that they could not see before. And then telescopes got more powerful. They could see more and more and more and more. Now we see lots because of more technology. Years ago, we did not know about the other planets. Now we find planets almost every day because we have, now we have the technology to see and to see more. So when the technology, technology advances, they start observing particles that were not protons, they were not neutrons, they were not electrons. And they looked like, like we had the particles that would look like a proton because they would also have the same charge as a proton. But, but it was not a proton, it was heavier than a proton. So it's a mess. And then, it came the idea and the conclusion that, in fact, we have other particles more fundamental than protons and neutrons. Protons are not fundamental. Be why? Because the protons have an structure. There, there are things inside the proton that makes the proton a proton. There are things inside the neutron, neutron that makes a neutron a neutron. And those are what we call quarks. We're not going to talk much about quarks here. But in principle, a proton and a proton would have two quarks U and a quark D, or the other way around, and most confused. And the neutron would have two quarks D and a quark U. So combining quarks, we could have different particles, like the proton, the neutron, and later they saw all the particles, they started giving names, lambda, sigma, whatever, using all the Greek alphabet. And the same before what they call leptons. So we had families. So this is one family, and this is another family, and another family. Huh? And they go pretty much to get along. So, but, okay, let's go to neutrinos. How neutrinos basically interact. Okay, so this, the idea behind this is that all particles are identical. So if we have two neutrinos, if we have two electrons, the two electrons are identical. Nothing makes one electric, electron different from the other one. Uh, you have two muons, the two muons are identical, you cannot take one from the other. And the same goes for neutrinos. An electron neutrino, it's exactly like another electron neutrino. No difference. In principle, of course, you can distinguish the electron neutrino from the muon neutrino. Okay? No a clear difference. Why they are different? Remember, the electron neutrino, when they interact with the always produce an electron. Okay? And the muon neutrino, the always produce muon. And finally, the tau neutrino, they all through the tau. So they are different. Huh? An electron neutrino is not like an electron, a moon neutrino or tau neutrino. Okay? So electron, moon, tau, they have the particle. Uh, to have an idea, uh, the, the, a, a moon is 200 times heavier than an electron, much, much, much heavier. And the tau is 3,500 times heavier than an electron. So that's basically why, so the, the lightest one is the electron. So in a process, in a decay process, the moon will eventually decay into an electron. And the uh, neutrinos will show. A tau will decay in a moon, a moon electron. So at the end, if things left, are allow it to happen, we end up with electrons. Okay? And by the way, here we saw three kinds, three three families that are also called flavors, okay? And the question is that if that all, we're not sure yet if there are more 
families. So, so far, we, we think that there are three kinds of neutrinos, the electron, the moon, and the tau. Maybe there is a fourth one. I'm going to talk about this later. What's important is they are always associated. Neutrinos are always. By always, we mean always. Okay? No exception. Create. Uh, maybe there are exceptions, but anyway. Uh, always created or destroyed by a process that we call weak, weak interaction. We'll see that maybe a little bit later. In association with its charged parts. So it never comes alone. In a process where a neutrino is created, an electron neutrino is created, an electron will also show up. A new neutrino, a new one will show up, and a tau neutrino, a tau will show up. This is a very important feature. Because in the experiments, when you want to detect the electron, a neutrino, we don't see the neutrino. The neutrino has no charge. It's a problem. But we can see the electron associated with the neutrino electron. A moon associated with moon neutrino. So this is very important. So, here to, to give an idea, what is Neutrinos and charged the left always have the same flavor. Always, always. So, in the creation, let's say we have a source. We have a source of whatever. And you, you see here, see, the source produces an electron, neutrino, and an electron. They come together. But also, it may happen to produce a muon neutrino and a muon. Or a tau neutrino and a tau. It doesn't happen. It doesn't happen. No. We don't have a source that produces a mu neutrino together with a tau. Or a mu neutrino with an uh, electron. They always come together in a creation. And when they occur, uh, when they happen in a, a detection, when they interact with that block of, uh, the zillions of neutrinos interact with some block of lead. We have a detect. We have here, for instance, electron neutrino, an interaction, an electron. Or maybe you have a mu neutrino, with a mu. Or a tau neutrino, with a tau. That's a way we can know what was interacting. If, if you have neutrinos of different kinds, and now we know we have different kinds, how, will we, how do we know which neutrino is interacting? An electron neutrino, a mu neutrino, a tau neutrino? Well, we know it because we see what comes out of that. If there's an electron, what's an electron neutrino? Some more, one more, and so on. This doesn't happen. No. Okay? We don't have a mu neutrino producing an electron here. Uh, uh, I've not mentioned this now, but there are also interactions. In this kind of process here, the neutrino is basically turning into an electron or a muon or tau. So basically, we start with a part that has no electric charge and then up with a part with charge. Of course, there is a compensation in the process. There are also interactions. There is a kind of interaction when the neutrino does not change. Yeah? This is a very difficult process to observe. We call a neutral current interaction. We're going to talk about that later. But for all practical purposes, that's what happens here. Now, fine. Uh, what are the sources of neutrinos? How do we get neutrinos? Well, there are many sources of neutrinos. We did not invent that. We have the sun. Of course, we have the stars, not just the sun. The sun is a good source of neutrinos. So here we have the Earth. Earth. And we have a detector here that we talk about detector a little bit later. And then lots of neutrinos coming from the sun. Okay? And they travel this distance. Hit until reaching Earth, 1.5, 10 to 8 kilometers. Here's a source of neutrinos. Cosmic rays. There are cosmic rays coming from the outer space that are hitting Earth atmosphere, and there are lots of neutrinos coming, and also neutrinos when they interact with the atmosphere. They produce neutrinos also. So there are lots of neutrinos coming here to Earth. So Earth, we get neutrinos from the sun. We get neutrinos coming from Cosmic rays. But you have also radioactive decays. Okay? Remember that when I mentioned that atom bomb that they have uh, uranium that decays something lighter in this process, we have neutrinos. That's not an invention. We did not invent that. Okay? Earth is full of elements like uranium and the other material that are radioactive materials, and this radioactive process, they produce neutrinos. We have this on Earth, you know. and here you have the idea. So, so this sample sends lots of neutrinos, 10, 
to 11 per square centimeter per second, okay? And you have radiating, radioactive decays on Earth. A small amount, much smaller, but not little. So right now, at the moment, we here on Earth, sitting in our room, there is radiation coming from the Earth to us. No? Supernova, by well, a supernova, uh, this, this is what happened at uh, X-rays, uh, cosmic rays is here, okay? And supernova happens once in a while. When a supernova happens, lots of energy, and almost all the energy of the supernova comes with neutrinos, all kinds of neutrinos. Huh? So, unfortunately, we do not know when a supernova will happen. But if you are ready, we can, have, we can build detectors, facilities, ready, waiting for a supernova to happen, okay? There are neutrinos of all kinds. Nuclear reactors, as I mentioned. Uh, here's nuclear. See, this is the amount. Of, and neutrinos that they produce. Okay? And nowadays, we have reactors. What happens here? We, we have no control what's coming from the sun. We are scientists who want to run experiments. If we run experiments with the neutrinos coming from the sun, we have no control. We have to to use whatever the sun is sending to us. We have no control. The same come for <clears throat> cosmic rays, radioactive, supernova, whatever. Uh, reactor, nuclear reactor, well, we have some control because we build the nuclear reactor. So in principle, we know the power of the nuclear reactor. We know how many neutrinos are produced. And the nuclear reactor, in fact, is an isotope. It means that this nuclear reactor here is sending neutrinos uh, in all directions, right? So, in fact, we are going to have a detector somewhere here, for instance, here. But we're missing a good part of it. And then we have more recently an accelerator. So, in a lab, like a Fermi lab or CERN in Europe, we can build a system, an accelerator, that we produce neutrino. So, this accelerator, this is very important, we produce a beam of a neutrino. Beam of neutrino. And we have some control of this beam of neutrino. So we, we can say, okay, I'm producing such amount of neutrinos, and we know the energy of the neutrinos. We don't, we don't have control of the energy of neutrinos coming from the sun or from Earth or from supernova. But here in accelerator, we do have control. Huh? We have control. So accelerators are a part. I'm going to talk a little bit about that later. Ah, now, my, although there are many sources of neutrinos, my favorite one is this one, bananas. Yes, bananas are a good source of neutrinos. Okay? A banana, a simple banana that we eat. I eat a banana every day. My dogs eat bananas. A banana emits about one million neutrinos, one million neutrinos per day by the decay of the small amount of red potassium. A banana has potassium. Probably if you do exports, you, you heard that bananas are good because they're a good source of potassium. So part of that potassium in banana is radioactive, so it decays. That's natural. There's nothing you can do about that. It's not a problem. We haven't eaten banana for millions of years. So a banana, one million neutrinos a day due to the radioactive potassium. So if you eat one banana, you're going to produce one million neutrinos a day ourselves. It's a good source of neutrinos, not good for an experiment. Now, and so what? Then comes the question. Okay, how can the sun shine for such a long time? The sun has been around for millions and millions of years, unless you are creationist and believe that's only 6,000 years. But I, I don't want to get into this argument. So... The sun has been shining for a long time. Okay. How come? How come that thing is shining for millions and millions of years, still shining there, and you pretty much know that it's going to shine for, for several billion more years? How come? What's producing all that energy that's hitting Earth? So some theories, some ideas came. And the very first idea that came centuries ago is that the sun was a kind of uh, a, a chariot, yeah? with the horses pulling in fire, going across the sky. This is a very nice description, very poetic, but it's not really scientific. From the scientific point of view, the first idea that came was that it was coal. So the sun was a big ball of coal, 
people knew coal. They used coal a lot for centuries and centuries. Uh, and they used coal a lot when the steam <clears throat> engines were developed. So they knew that coal was a good source of energy. And I said, okay, the, all the sun, and maybe the other stars, on all the sun, is a big ball of coal that's burning. And that produces all the energy that you get here. And so people made some calculation. Because you know, people already knew the distance of the sun to Earth, the amount of energy that was arriving here at the time, blah, blah, blah. Knew everything, made the calculation, said, no, no, this would not work. Because if the sun were a big ball of coal, it would have died a long time ago. So all the, all the coal would have been consumed and the sun would not be. So whatever is producing all that energy cannot be coal. Forget about that. People have to come with another idea. <clears throat> and this was the. 19th century, beginning of 20th century or so. Another idea is that the gravitational contraction mechanism is very complicated, very sophisticated. But people that are studying that could uh, know that uh, by contra gravitational contraction, because that's a huge mass, the sun is a huge mass, that produces energy. And energy will be radiated from the sun. Huh? Um, yes, you could do it. They also run the calculations and no again. Because although that would work in principle, that means that the sun would be only about 20 million years old. No? The process would not be older than that. So yeah, the sun is much, much, much older than 20 million. So that process. So at the beginning of the 20th century or so, there came another idea. That is radioactivity. Remember that equation that's famous, the, the energy, mc squared? So the energy is involved there. A radi radioactivity, as we see in the nuclear explosion yeah, or in a nuclear react, produces a lot of energy in principle for a small amount of matter. Remember, a small amount. A small amount produces a huge amount of energy. So maybe that's what happened in this uh, process, like the one that we saw in nuclear explosion, similar to one, when, when it's released the energy, because energy and matter are associated. Okay? And then, we have energy. Yeah? And yes, that's what happens. That's what happens. Yeah, remember that the connection with the energy and mass is a very important one. Okay? If, it, if you go to the, take the table of elements, periodic table of elements, you have the hydrogen, hydrogen one proton and one electron. And then you take the helium. Helium has two protons, two neutrons, and two electrons. Okay, if that's the case, the mass of the helium should be basically four times the mass of the helium. Okay, the helium is one proton, one neutron have pretty much the same mass, the other one has four of them, and so But if you make this calculation, if you just compare, you see that that's not what happens. The mass of the element are not exactly a multiple of each other. What happens is because there is an energy that's necessary to keep them together adds mass to the system. And when you release the system, when, like breaking down an atom, that's what they have, that the energy that was extra mass disappear coming in the form of energy. Okay? I'm not going to talk much about this slide here. There's about one hour, just going to advance a little bit more. Yeah. But basically, just, that's describing the idea that how energy would be produced in the sun. So it's a longer process. But with notes here that the pro one electron here, one neutrino here, neutrino here, neutrino here, neutrino here, uh, neutrino here. So this long chain of events producing energy at the end of the sun would produce neutrino. See, electron neutrino, electron neutrino, all them are electron neutrino, electron neutrino, electron neutrino. So you neutrino and those neutrinos will escape from the sun. And hit Earth, okay. And then it, making this calculation for the guys who love to make a calculation like that, we know already the energy that's coming from the sun. You know all the things, so it's possible. Supposing that that's what happened, there was a theory describing this. We know we can know how many neutrinos, in the case electron neutrinos, are coming from the sun. We know that. We can make a calculation. Some guys made that calculation, and the calculation showed that this, uh, all these amounts. 100 billion neutrinos per square centimeter per second reach Earth for at the 
each and every second, each second, each cent square centimeter stroke. My thumbnail, you have 100 billion neutrinos from the sun coming through it. It's a lot of neutrinos. And so, what people are, ah, okay. So, if you measure the amount of neutrinos coming from the sun here, we can check. Check. Check this model. You can see if this is true, because this model allows us to calculate. Calculate amount of neutrinos. Okay. So then we measure neutrinos, and you see if match the theory and the experiment match. Let's do that. Remember, they knew already how to find neutrinos. They made an experiment to get neutrinos from that nuclear reactor in Savannah River. So let's do it, but rather than have neutrinos from the nuclear reactor, let's get neutrinos from the sun and measure it. Okay, so let's observe the, the sun. So they made pretty much a similar experiment, but in this case, this guy here, John Bacow, uh, calculated the neutrino flux from the sun and said, guys, this is the amount of neutrino that's arriving here from the sun. Ah! And they, another scientist, decided to make an experiment. So this is, this is there is someone here, so a man. Okay, so we have an idea of the size. And here, they went to a gold mine underground. Why underground? Because see, neutrinos are hard to interact, as we saw before. And the environment is full of everything. So by going underground, they use earth and the rock as a shield. Yeah? Because only neutrinos, remember, neutrinos go through uh, light years of lead without interaction. So a mountain would not be a problem for neutrinos. So, and in this tank, they had chlorine. So the idea is that, in, the, in this case, this neutrino interacting with the chlorine would produce an atom of argon, it would change the atom. If you look at the periodic table, you see that they are together. So they had a tank, huh? 380 square uh, cubic meters of this material here, underground in the gold mine in South Dakota. What they had to do, the following, they knew that they had their only this Cl2C uh, material here. They knew they had this thing there. Only that. They knew there was no argon in there. No argon. No argon. No argon there. Why? Why? Because they, took, they were careful to have a very pure sample. Then they would let this there and wait some time, days, weeks, months, whatever. And then they would go and count the number of argon atoms and see. Okay, so for each argon atom they find, they could find, it means there was an, a neutrino interacting. So by counting the number of argon, they could know how many neutrinos interact. And since they know the distance from the sun, oh, it's easy to calculate to see if the number was right. Okay, here's the guy. So what they expect? based on the calculations from Bacal and other guys, they expect to observe about 51 atoms of argon. They found only 17. Uh oh, that's a problem. They found about one third, right? About one third. 51, 17 is one third. Something's wrong. And, but many people said, hey, come on. Are you able to count 17 atoms of argon? Because this tank would be like having a swimming pool. Get a swimming pool, 25 meters, 7 meters, and about 2 meters. A swimming pool. Filled with a product. What you have to do is that huge amount of liquid to be able to find atoms, 51 atoms, 17 atoms. And the answer is yes, they could do that. They were chemists, they could do that. And they found only 17. So something is wrong, something is very, very wrong. Either that the model that uh, predicts the amount of sun, the things come from the sun, so this is wrong, this is not what is happening in the sun, 
Or, of course, uh, this experiment is wrong. Uh, maybe they think they could count argon atoms, but they are really missing. They are missing uh, about 30 atoms. Uh, the experiment was not very well done. Uh, but no, they run this for years. Yeah? But they didn't do that in one day. So, for have an idea, from 1970 to 1994, 24 years. And the here, see, uh, this is what expected. Okay. I said, some years more. Huh? So, uh, okay. But they never really observed the eight that was expected. So, in average, that's what they found. So there was a difference be between what they really observed and what the theory was saying. So about one third, only one third. Uh, this experiment was done, redone, fixed, and the calculation was also done. So the guy who made the calculation maybe was wrong. The, everything was redone, and recalculate, and no matter what happened, there was only one third of nutrients come from the sun. So. What could happen? Well, maybe the theory was wrong. Okay. Maybe the experiment was wrong. Maybe both were wrong. Okay, because uh, you don't know. The theory and experience should agree. If they don't agree, well, either the theory is wrong or the experiment is wrong. Or both are wrong. Maybe the guy calculated that it should be eight, in fact, it should be uh, 15, and the experiment was also wrong. So everything was wrong. They could not. And there's a fourth possibility of this, that both were right. Okay? Both were right. How could that happen? Uh, may I go, may I continue, or says I was too much for today? Well, actually, we got probably 15 more minutes. Okay. So I, 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 I will advance a little bit. Okay. Okay, so, so th there, this was a problem. So neutrinos were creating a situation again, again. In the beginning of the century, there was a situation people considered maybe the energy is not conserved. And now this damn thing that nobody really knows what is doing that in the universe is making a mess. But how could both be right? Both of you wrong is easy to understand. Theory is wrong, the experience is wrong, we have to improve both. But how could both be right? And they both could, can be, could be right for one very simple reason. They were not really dealing with the same thing. With Bacal, that guy here, what is the guy? With Bacal calculated the neutrino flux from the sun. And what they were measuring here was the neutrino flux at Earth, here on Earth. Okay? Well, it's not the same thing. Well, what, well I don't know. From the sun to here, there is a long distance. Well, it's not exactly the same thing. So, could something be, ha be happening in between the Sun and the Earth? It's a long distance, right? A very long distance. Where is it? Uh, where is it? 1.5, 10 to 8 kilometers. It takes light several minutes to come here. So, it's a long distance. And the neutrinos were going all this distance. And maybe something was happening. Uh, and all this way, I don't know, maybe some it is way in the between playing game, joke with us. Ah, uh, not reasonable. Anyway, what could be? And the theory of physics, especially quantum physics, everything you have something strange. Well, quantum physics may explain it. And there is a possible theoretical explanation for that. Remember that we saw. In fact, that we have three kinds of neutrinos, or two, at the same time, they've taught us two. Three times of neutrinos. Electron neutrinos, mu neutrinos, and tau neutrinos. Okay? Three separate entities, fine. But in quantum physics, okay, when you're going to describe particles, like electrons, protons, or neutrinos, we cannot really use the classical physics from Newton and the other guys. It doesn't, simply doesn't work, completely different. You have to describe using quantum physics. And in quantum physics, basically, all these particles are described by a wave function. It's a wave that describes how they move around, they go around. 
And the waves have properties that are very interesting, and you don't have much problem with this uh, wave situation when you are dealing with things that you really understand as a wave, like sound or light. But a particle like an electron also behaves like a wave in quantum physics. So some strange things that uh, is not strange when it happens to sound also may happen to the particle, to matter. Yeah? And one thing that may happen is a mixing. Yeah? Two waves may interfere with each other, and at the end, you have something different. I'm not going to get into details here, but basically the idea is that there is a, these particles, the neutrinos, the moon neutrino, the tau neutrino, the electron neutrino, they are wave, and they mix each other. They are not pure. So when they advance in the space, since the, there are waves that describe them, huh? they interfere to each, each other, so they change. So what starts as a moon neutrino at some point may show as an electron neutrino, and then as a tau neutrino and vice versa. If you make a calculation, in fact, it's not that complicated. If you know a little bit of quantum physics, it's not very complicated. But it basically means there is an angle between them. So you have uh, the neutrinos difference. And at the end, if you make some calculation, you come to a result like that. This is the probability, okay? Probability. So here we have the probability. Uh, here we, I'm using alpha and beta. So because it doesn't matter. Here, the probability that something that starts as a neutrino alpha, okay, could be a neutrino electron, turn or show up as a neutrino beta, so different. So this is an expression like that. That's really not a very difficult expression. Okay? So in this equation, okay, two things come to our attention. One, at this angle. This is the angle that it, we show here. It's like if you have the two neutrinos here, so we call neutrino alpha and the beta. And it could be electron and moon. Okay? And they are, there is an angle between the axis, whatever, and the other one that we call neutrino one, neutrino two. That would be the fundamental basic neutrino. Huh? So, sorry. And here, what's very important, shows something that is the, the square difference of the mass of the neutrinos. Note that if this angle is zero, if zero, if it's zero, this probability is zero, okay? Because it's, it's this sign of zero is zero. So if this angle is zero, there is no such angle, the probability is zero. So a neutrino that starts with an alpha neutrino or a moon neutrino, will always be a moon neutrino, so on. So, and another thing is this mass, square mass difference. If it's zero, again, because if it, this is zero, this is different, square different, is zero, you have another sign, another sign, zero. So for this probability to be different from zero, two things must happen. This angle that people are supposing here must be different from zero, and the square difference, the mass is, difference of the mass is square of the neutrino should be also different from zero. Well, that's what the a theory would say, but this is strange, okay? This is strange at some point. Uh, people could accept well the idea, because in quantum physics, is that there was an angle between the two things. It is the shift in the angle produced. That's okay, people. But the second thing here, the second thing here, listen, the idea from Pauli and that what people have been talking about for decades, is that the neutrino had no mass. Neutrino, uh, Pauli said neutrino have no electric charge, and neutrinos have no mass. But if neutrino have no mass, this is zero. Okay, this is zero. This will be zero. So for that, for this not to be zero, at least one of them, at least one of the neutrinos must have a mass. At least one of them. Okay, and in this case here is a simplification when you have only two neutrinos. But later, since we found the third neutrino, the tau neutrino, we have to expand this to three neutrinos. The equation is a little bit similar, that's a little bit longer, but then this equation, the, 
mass, square mass difference between the neutrino 1, neutrino 2, and neutrino 1 and 3, whatever you call them, is would be different there. So for that to be true, the angle must be different from there. Okay, not a big deal. People will be happy. But then the mass of the neutrino, at least one, cannot be zero. Cannot be zero. Oh, that would be a big problem because the theory, all theory was based on mass zero. But this is true. This explains from the mathematical point of view. But mathematics can do anything. But just because you find a mathematical equation that explains something doesn't mean that that is really happening. So you have to check to see if it is happening. So that's what would happen. So here we have a neutrino, say, alpha. So at the very beginning, when it's produced, like say, the sun, né, the probability of finding the neutrino alpha is one. All of them are alpha, and none, none of them is the beta, beta. But as they evolve and as they advance a distance, né, here, so L is the distance that they are traveling. And the E is the energy, okay? So as they advance, what they have at some point here, you have a, a maximum do neutrino. So they oscillate. But there has to be a long distance, of course, depending on the energy. And the distance from the sun to Earth uh, is a very long distance. And the energy of the neutrinos involved, well, they know the energy involved. So it was possible to calculate and say, well, it's possible. Because, see, the, the experiments they did before with the react nuclear reactors, the, the detector was very close to the nuclear reactor, uh, a few meters, 10 meters, 20 meters, 50 meters, very close. That's not enough for this process, if it happens, to be observed. So they never observed. But when they start looking at the sun, that was... 10 to 8 kilometers uh, away, that distance was long enough for this process that affected to be observed it really exists. So uh, you could make calculation. You, you know L, the distance from the sun to Earth, the energy of the neutrino well, could be calculated. They knew all. So it was possible to have an idea of what's happening here. But you have to measure. You have to, because if this is true, what happened, they were observing one third of the neutrinos coming from the sun because they were measuring uh, electron neutrinos coming from the sun. And then at some point, this electric, due to the oscillation, they would turn into moon neutrinos or tau neutrinos. So they are observing the electron neutrinos, they see only one third of them. So if this is true, they were able to use this equation to see how many moon neutrinos would be there if they know the mass. So how do you check to see if this is really happening? Well, Let's look for the muon neutrinos coming from the sun. There should be no muon neutrinos coming from the sun. Come on. There should be no tau neutrinos coming from the sun. Only electron neutrinos. So you see one third. The other two thirds of neutrinos should materialize as tau neutrinos and muon neutrinos. Let's do it. Okay. Just to understand a little bit how that could happen, this fall. We have the oscillation of the neutrinos. Oh, here, you have a problem starting. It has to be in Portuguese, but that's okay. The neutrinos oscillation. In quantum mechanics, in quantum mechanics, okay, a particle is a wave, okay, a wave, okay? and the mass of the particle defines the frequency. So the frequency, you know, the frequency, uh, mass, okay. So if you have neutrinos with different mass means that their waves have different frequencies. And that's the key. Huh? So here we have a wave 1. And here we have a wave 2. OK? Although they look the same here, if we are careful, we see that the frequency is a little bit different. See, they are, they are starting here together. But here, they are not. Okay, so they shift a little bit. Why? Because their frequency is a little bit different. So if this, if the neutrinos, they are really a mixture of something, and they have different mass, that's what happens. The frequencies are different, and then when they interfere with each other, if they interfere with each other, something like that may happen. 
Okay, they are different. Huh? So something that starts that, that we observe first as a moon neutrino may show up as a electron neutrino and vice versa. Huh? And as they evolve in time. But is this real? Mm. And where are all the neutrinos? So, and how can we find them? Okay. Uh, then two experiments came into play. I'm going to just stop after these two experiments that are very briefly. Super Kamiokande and SNO. Super Kamiokande, let's see. How, how they did it? All these new experiments for neutrinos are usually huge, big. Why? Because you need lots of mass. The target has to be very big to see neutrinos. So basically, they, they are one kilometer underground. Here's the thing, okay? Huh? It is a huge cylinder, very big cylinder, okay? The size of the cylinder is 41 meter high, much bigger than that building, okay? And 30, 40 meter diameter, so it's a cylinder, yeah? Here is 41, what a log 42, and here is 40. Very big. Yeah? There you have 50,000 tons of water, pure water. Water is hydrogen and, and the oxygen, okay? And around them, we have 13,000 for multiplied. That same device that was used in the 50s to first detect neutrino. See? Here you have a photo inside. You see this thing here? This is a small boat with people. There are three guys there. They are setting, preparing the forum supply. So all this wall inside of the, the tank is covered with uh, 13,000 forum multipliers. Very, very expensive, a huge amount of that. Then what happened? The idea is that the neutrino coming from the sun, for instance, will interact and when it interacts, it produces a charged particle. Remember, the neutrino, electron neutrino, we produce an electron. A mu neutrino, we produce a muon. Okay? And in the water, once they are produced, they start moving faster than light in water. Remember that the light in the water, the speed of light at 300,000 kilometers a second is the maximum speed in vacuum, light. Yeah? Goes there. But in the water, light goes much slower than that. So it's possible for a particle to go faster than light in there. And when that happens, when a charge, the particle goes faster than light in the medium, it produces a radiation that's called Cherenkov radiation. Okay? This is radiation, remember, like the four multipliers can detect the radiation. Light doesn't matter. Our eyes cannot see, but the four multipliers will build it to see that particular light. And then you can reconstruct it. And so they detect the evidence of oscillation. So the, the idea is basically this thing here, okay? You have this process here. Here you have an electron neutrino interacting with, uh, remember this huge amount of water has lots of electrons there. So eventually one neutrino will collide with an electron and then you're gonna have the electron moving, like here. Huh? And this electron is going very fast, produces Cherenkov light, and this light will hit the wall of the tank, and then the four multipliers will see it as a ring. Okay? A ring. That's what they see there. Right? Of course, if you have a moon, the moon has electric charge. So if you have a moon neutrino, the moon neutrino will produce a moon in the tank. An electron neutrino will produce an electron. Remember the sub? They always come together. So a moon and an electron in the tank, they produce. Both will produce a ring, but the rings are different. Huh? Huh? What happens at the ring produced by moon? There's not, there's not a point here to explain why, but it, this is also to simulate. The moon that a ring produces is a very well defined ring, like here. And the moon that the electron produces is blurred, it's not as precise. So we can know for the kind of ring, there are programs, software programs, that we analyze, they will reconstruct the ring and say, oh, this is a, comes from moon. Oh, this one comes from an electron. Oh, how come? So there are elect, there are moon neutrinos coming from the sun also? Yes, that was a very good hint that there were moon neutrinos coming from the sun. What, what you see here, each one of these squares, see, is a four multiplier. So 
So this forum is prior, got light. This one got light. Here, light, 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 once in a while. So that's why you can see a ring. And here, the same thing. Okay? And the color, the color is artificial. Okay? We produce this color to have. The color indicates the, the time. So you can know exactly when the light hit this one. Uh, blue means early. So light first hit that area here. And this one was last. Here was last. So they can know if it was a new uh, neutrino or if it was an electric neutrino. And they can know the momentum. Why the momentum? Because the momentum is associated with the energy. Remember? Uh, if you take the classical model, uh, momentum is the mass of the particle time to speed. That's one. And the energy, the uh, kinetic energy, is also half the mass square of the speed. So if you know the mass of the particle and you know its speed, you know the energy, oh, you know the moment. So knowing the moment, you know the energy of vice versa. They are the same. So they can reconstruct the momentum and then they can reconstruct the energy. By reconstructing from the field they see, a particle with more energy, is more energy, more churning of light. They produce more light because that's how it works. They have more energy means they have their speed, they are going faster and faster and faster and faster. If they go as fast as they go, more Cherenkov light, they are going faster and faster and faster than light. So more Cherenkov light, more energy. So you can know the energy. So this kind of thing has an energy, the energy in measuring elect uh, electron volts. So could, uh, we don't use joules because joules is not good. So you can know the energy. You have three kinds of energy. It is energies. So they can know if it was a moon, and they can know the energy or momentum of the thing. So that was a good sign. Here's the same thing. Uh, look at that. The three guys working. The, well, there is a water. The water is ultra. So they can know. They reconstruct. And they got a good evidence, a good, good sign. That, yes, there are all the kinds of neutrinos coming from the sun. So this one third we get is not everything. The other two thirds comes a moon, and maybe tau. We have to complete the story. So uh, I'm going to stop for today. Is that okay? Hello. Hello. Sorry. Hello. Uh, may Hello. I, should I stop now? Should I stop now? Yeah, I, I, I believe so. I think this is okay for today's yeah. lecture. So we'll resume tomorrow at Three. one p.m. Is that okay? Well, one, one, one p.m. For me, it's okay. Okay. And please, so, please, I, I show lots of things. I know. So if I have questions, just send the questions to Professor Castromonte. He will share with me. And we, we try to answer the best as we can. Okay. Okay? Yes. So, so, so meet you tomorrow. Does anybody have a question now that want to do? Does anybody have any question for Elio today? No, not many. Just something that it was not very clear. Are people sleeping? Uh, maybe? Oh. No? I hope not. <laughs> so send your question to Professor Castlemont and we talk again tomorrow. Okay, so let's thanks uh, Professor Elio for today's lecture. Uh, so let's resume tomorrow at 1 p.m. So anyway, thank you guys. See you tomorrow at 1 p.m. So, thank you, Elio. Bye bye. Bye bye. Arj, sí, por favor, eh, si hay alguna pregunta. I'm still here. Eh, there is... Dari, Daira, do you have any question? Puedes hacerlo en español, no hay ningún problema. Ah. Él es fluente en, este, en español también. I know all the bad words. Yes. <laughs> don't be, don't, don't be ashamed. Be Ask it. Don't be shy. Ask it. Was well, lots of things. Was just. I do not expect people this could understand everything. I just try to make a description of some basic stuff. Uh, buenas tardes. Buenas tardes. Eh, 
Bueno, eh, en realidad soy estudiante de letras, no sé demasiado sobre ciencias, pero últimamente he tenido bastante curiosidad respecto a la física de partículas y me preguntaba si quizás podía explicarme un poquito más sobre la, el hecho de que la, los neutrinos sean partículas asociadas a otras partículas. Uh, I don't understand what you mean by that. Hello? Hello. What do you mean? What do you mean by, by that? ¿Qué es, qué, es lo que, ¿Qué es lo que no te... O sea, cuál, la, tu pregunta es por qué los neutrinos están asociados a los leptones? A ese, ese es tu... ¿Por qué están asociados necesariamente? Sí. Ah. Esa es tu pregunta. Ok. Uh, ¿Y qué es eso, Nelly? Yes, yes. So you want to know why the neutrons, the electron neutrons are associated with the electron, right? Right. For instance, or, yes. Or the, or the moon neutrons. Okay. Uh, we don't love them. We don't love uh, particles. Yeah. Okay. Every time someone starts a question with why, okay, uh, I say that you should, you, should, you should ask whoever designed the universe. Okay. Uh, basically, what physics do what is what physics uh, does of try to do is to understand how okay how uh, 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 how things happen and not why things happen okay uh, so it's a more philosophical point of this question so to make it easier i don't know okay but that's what we observe yeah? uh, we observe that the neutrino comes associated with another particle In fact, there are some theories, some ideas that show that this may not be true. Maybe this will change. For instance, let's say I said at the beginning that an electron neutrino is always associated with an uh, uh, electron, right? A mu neutrino is associated with a mu. Fine. But now at the end, I'm saying that something that starts with an electron neutrino changes in advance and then may show as a mu neutrino. So something here is strange, okay? Something strange. because then I have this muon neutrino that I have here at the end was associated with an electron at some point there in the sun. So there are what we call a conservation loss. And we believe, what we used to say, that the lepton number conserved. Lepton, remember that I said that the electron neutrinos belong to what we call a lepton. Eh? A strange word. And there's an idea that electron number conserved. It means the following. The same way that energy is conserved, it means if you have an amount of energy at the beginning of a process. At the end of a process, we have the same amount of energy. This energy may not show the same way, but you have the same. The energy is conserved. It was to say that the lepton number is conserved. It means that you have a process where they have some number of leptons at the beginning. For instance, you have at the beginning of the process, you have an electron, okay? Electron is one lepton. So let's say the number of leptons is one. So at the end of the process, if the electron, uh, lepton number is conserved, we should have, we also have one lepton, okay? So remember, that's why it comes into the game neutrino and the anti-neutrino, because if one particle is an, a, a lepton, It has this left, I say number one, one is one. The antiparticle would be minus one. So if the neutrino is a lepton, and you have one neutrino, say, well, the lepton number is one. But you have an antineutrino, the lepton number is minus one. So in, in the beginning of a process, for instance, you have a, a muon. And I said that the muon comes together with a muon neutrino. I don't know why. The, the designer of the universe decided that it was cool to do that that way. Okay, but it comes with a more neutrino. Then, but that also moon decays, goes to something lighter, and the lighter is the electron. I'll show that later. Then we start with a moon, and the moon at some point will come down to an electron, and then the uh, moon, the moon neutrino, uh, the moon neutrino will show up there. But come on, listen, suddenly you have an electron. Something's wrong because the moon, the lepton number is one, for instance. And now at the end, we have a moon neutrino whose lepton number would be one. And you have a electron whose lepton number is also one. So we have one lepton at the beginning 
and two leptons at the end. Come on. There's not nothing conservative there. And now we have an electron just came into existence. And what about the electron neutrino that should also be there? And so that's what happens. In fact, it will be an electron, and there will be a moon, and there will be an electron, there will be a neutrino, and the anti neutrino also show up there, providing everything. So, but if, as they have advanced in time, that the moon neutrino will show up as an electron neutrino. So at, this, at some point, I will have an electron neutrino that was associated originally with a moon neutrino. So it's confusing. So this is something that has not been resolved. But at the moment, what you know is that when they are created, at that very moment, they come together. I don't know why. Why the universe is like that? But that's how we see it. Right? Why is it's very embarrassing. Physics tries to describe how, how things happen, not why. Sorry, uh, that's all I, all I can say. But that's the same everywhere, right? Why energy is conserved? Ah, I don't know. No. What's time? I don't know. Don't know what's time. Uh, why time works this way? I don't know. Time is we, we observe time. Well, why relativity is like that? It's very strange. Why? Why you describe uh, an electron or a proton like a wave in quantum physics? Uh, I don't know. It sounds very strange to me, but. It works. That's how you observe things to happen. Why? I don't know. That's how it is. Why our, our eyes see only a, a spectrum of light from a frequency to the other one? Why? Well, I don't know. That's how it is. I don't know why. So we usually do not know why the laws of physics are what they are. We, do, we are very happy when we find the laws of physics and you can work with them and we leave the why to the philosophers or the theologists and suffice. Doesn't matter. So it doesn't really answer your question, but it means that we don't know. It's like, yeah, I, 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 I found a very complicated way to say, I don't know. We don't know, yes. Don't know. And that's what's interesting in physics. That's interesting in physics, because if you knew everything, there would be no point in being a physicist and being a scientist. You know everything. Well, what are you doing? We don't know. That's the point. We don't know. The moment we know something, it's not interesting anymore. That's why people also got very excited when they noticed at the very beginning of the 20th century that the energy was not, apparently, the energy wasn't be conserved. And they said, oh, that's something we don't understand. Something is wrong. They got very excited when they saw that the number of neutrinos coming from the sun did not match the theory. They said, oh, gosh, something we don't know. Physicists, science are very strange. Most people are happy knowing things. We get happy when they find something we don't know. And then we try to understand. Eh? And we get happy when we understand what's happening and how it's happening. And we don't understand why. Sorry. Yeah. That's okay. It. What? Okay, thank you, Elio, for your answer. Uh, it's the best it's I could. A, the best I it could was do. a very long and fancy way to say no. We I don't just know. don't know. Yeah, yeah we don't know. <laughs> anyway, okay. So again, thank you, Elio, for today's lecture, and thank you guys for attending this mini course. Uh, mini course, and uh, we are resumed tomorrow uh, afternoon at one p.m. So see you tomorrow, guys. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you, Elio. Uh, by the way, you are recording this, right? What's it? Are you recording the presentation? Of course, yes. So people can see later if they want. Of course, yes. It will be. Okay. I'm going to post it at, uh, on the YouTube. I'm going to send okay. a link, you know, for everyone to, to watch your lecture. Fine. Okay. See you, see you tomorrow. See you tomorrow. Bye, guys. Thank you.